right, turn in your Bibles to Revelation 9. Revelation chapter 9 with our message, They Will Not Repent. If you're visiting here at Calvary Chapel, we have not randomly chosen to uh, share from Revelation chapter 9. A portion of God's word from Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation 19, which is chapter after chapter of the revealing of the last day's judgment of God on planet earth during a seven year time of great tribulation. And so our custom is here at Calvary Chapel, those who have been with us for a while have discovered this. We go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So last week we looked at verses 1 through 12, and this week we're going to look at verses 13 through 21. And, and every week, whether it's a Sunday morning or a Saturday night or a Wednesday night, I just feel like I'm doing a book report on God's Word, sharing with you what the Lord says and believing with all of my heart what He says and the power of it to change our life. For there's a promise built into this wonderful book of Revelation. It's the only book in the Bible that has that promise. In Revelation 1, 3, it says, happy is the person or the man or woman who reads the words of this prophecy, who hears the words of this prophecy, and who keeps and believes the words of this prophecy, if you will. And so we've been reading it, we've been hearing it, and I believe it. It's your choice whether you believe it or not and want to keep the truths that are revealed to you and I. And as we look, we've looked at the seven seals, now we're looking at the seven trumpets, and we're going to look at the sixth trumpet. When the trumpet blasts, there is a judgment that comes on planet Earth, a devastating judgment. I've mentioned it many times, but it bears repeating that Jesus said in Matthew 24, describing this time of great tribulation on the planet, he said, unless these days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, that there is such devastation that takes place through the judgment of God on planet earth. And I believe that the Lord is gonna rapture us out, the church, right before this seven year period of time so that we, the believers in the Lord, before that time will be taken out because it says in 1 Thessalonians that the Lord has not appointed you and I to the wrath of God. Now we have tribulation in this life, but it's not the wrath of God. We have struggles in this life, but it's not the wrath of God. We have trials in this life and adversity, but it's not the wrath of God. What we're reading about is a future event that is the wrath and judgment of God. And so as we look at this, pick it up with me as we start in verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. At the blowing of the trumpet of the sixth angel, there are four angelic beings four angels that are bound at the great river Euphrates. The river Euphrates is a, uh, a, a central focus of the Bible. From the Garden of Eden, we see the, the um, Euphrates River there in modern day Iraq. That's why that is called the, the cradle of civilization. And as these four supernatural beings were created, it says they were prepared God created these four angelic creatures for the hour, for the day, for the month, and for the year that they were going to come forth and kill and destroy and bring judgment to a third of mankind. Now think about that preparation. Think about God's foresight. God has this thing called foreknowledge that is is just mind-blowing. He declares the end from the beginning. You see, God dwells outside of time. God can see the past, the present, and the future dwelling in the eternal now all at once. God has this capacity that you and I could only long for. We only know second by second, moment by moment, how life is coming at us, but the Lord knows in advance. Not only does he know in advance, but he prepared these creatures, these angelic, these four angels for this day for this hour, for this month, for this year, to be released and bring the judgment of God. Now, just as God prepares angels for a day like this that is a yet future time of judgment, the Bible says the exact same same thing about you and I, that we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is the author of your life and my life. And he's prepared me, I know, for this day right now, for this hour, for this day, for this month, for this year of my life. I am his workmanship. You are his workmanship. God has a work for each one of us to do in this life. And I'd much rather be here sharing the word of God and the love of Christ and the grace of God than being one of the angelic creatures that is coming to destroy a third part of the earth. And yet, God has his purposes and all of his designs. His ways are above our ways. They're above our finding out. Now, think about it just for a moment. Do a little math with me. Back in chapter 6, the fourth seal, verse 8 of chapter 6, says that a fourth of the earth was killed. Now, if we used our numbers of today, there are 7 billion people on the planet. If a fourth of the earth was destroyed, that would be 1,750,000,000 people were killed. That reduced the population down to 5,250,000,000. But now if we take a third from that, a third from that, now that's 1,500,000,000 taken away and we're reduced to almost exactly half of the earth's population, just a little over, 3 billion, 600 million. So just in the judgments from the seven seal judgments, now the six trumpets, the earth has been so decimated by the supernatural judgment of God. These are things are not allegorical, they're not metaphorical, they're not, this is real judgment with real numbers that is coming on the planet in the future. Now, That always begs the question, well, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Well, I can tell you when it's not going to happen, and that is as soon as somebody sets a date or a time, it's not going to happen then. Because there are always those around Christianity that are real prophecy buffs that like to say this year or this time and this is going to happen. And you know right away when they start saying things like that, that they're wacko. Because Jesus said, you don't know the day or the hour, but what we know and what he tells us to know is the times and the seasons. Meaning, just as you begin to see the leaves come out, you know spring is coming. When the leaves begin to change and turn brown, you know fall is coming. And so it's that kind of season that you and I are in today that kind of like a a weatherman, if you will, we can see, yes, things are on the high rise and everything could happen now. We are ready today for these things to happen. The technology is in place. The, the appropriate players are in place. Everything's happening in such a way that these things could happen. That the rapture of the church could happen today and this time of great tribulation could begin. I had a high school girl ask me a week or two ago, hey, Pastor Rick, what, if Jesus was gonna come back today, what would you do differently? I said, nothing. It's Sunday. I hope the Lord would catch me preaching. I think it would be just great for the Lord, you know, the rapture of the church here we are worshiping the Lord or sharing the word and boom, you know, we're taking up nothing left but smoke and shoes. Or if I was to die, I, I would love to die preaching. Wouldn't it be cool? Just, you know, you step into heaven, Lord, I died preaching your word, yes. But you know what had happened. I'd kill over some massive heart attack and one of the servants team or ushers would jump up here with their CPR training, start beating on my chest And I just want you to know, if you ever see me keel over and you revive me and I come back, I'm going to punch you right in the mouth. (laughs) Just let me go. Just, you know, he's, oh, the pastor went off in glory. You know, I just, the the picture of of Pastor Gordon doing mouth to mouth with me on the stage just (laughs) is more than I can bear. And I love Gordon. I do. But when the high schooler asking me that, you know, it's that, it's that kind of thing that, well, I don't really want the Lord to come back today for you fill in the blank. You know, I live in such a way that I'm ready for the Lord to come back, whether it's breakfast or lunch or dinner or bedtime or in my sleep. You know, and that's really the way the Lord wants us to live, just in a way that, hey, we're ready. Now, Paul, John tells us in 1 John that when the Lord comes lest he catch us in a lifestyle that we would be ashamed. Now, if you're in a living in such a way that you would be ashamed if the Lord had come back, then you might want to evaluate, why don't you want the Lord to come back? What's going on in your life that 
that you would be ashamed of. I have a pastor friend who came to the Lord when he was five years old. He's known the Lord his entire life and he, he only got drunk once in his whole life. And he got mad at the Lord about something. He was 20 years old and he got drunk and he had this, you know, 70s kind of hippie van and it was the day of the hippie thing. And, and he got drunk and, and he said every time, he started throwing up. And so he's hanging his head out the, the door of his van and he's throwing up. And he goes, oh, Lord Jesus, please don't come back today. Oh, Lord Jesus, please. Yeah, I mean, that's not really how you want the Lord to catch you, right? Ralph and out of your 70s hippie van. And... But the underlying question, I think sometimes like the teenager and all of the, you know, the question that was put to me a couple of weeks ago really sparked those thoughts because I've had them ask me that question so often. Well, I say, hey, you ready for Jesus to come back? And the high schooler says, well, you know, I was really hoping the Lord would wait till I, I got married. And I said, oh, I, I promise you, you want Jesus to come back. And I'm a happily married guy. I love my wife with all my heart. But the thing is, is there's struggles in relationship, right? And sometimes they'll go on and say, and I was hoping now that they're married, I was hoping the Lord would wait till I have have two children. Oh, I I promise you, you want Jesus to come back. (laughs) Because you see that, and I say that not to, you know, Kids are a gift from the Lord. They're a heritage from the Lord. And marriage is, he who finds a wife finds a a good thing. It's It's a blessing from the Lord. But understand this, you and I are trapped in these carcasses with fallen sinful natures, right? So Paul the Apostle said, I'm hard pressed between these two things. I want to depart and go be with the Lord, which is far better, but to remain and be fruitful, Lord, if that's what the Lord wants. So that's my goal. I want to be fruitful, and faithful to the Lord until he takes me. But I'm excited about the Lord. I'm excited about heaven. I'm excited about having a new body. I'm excited about not having sin and temptation and and death and grieving and crying and, and emotional drama or struggles or all those issues that are just human. And so the question I would put to you as we see judgment on the horizon here in Revelation chapter nine is, are you ready for him to come today? Do you want him to come today? Are you right with God? Because as soon as you say, I don't want him to come today, you have to really examine what. What is the thing that you're longing for, you're hoping for, you're unwilling to give up so that he would come? Well, these angelic creatures kill now a third of mankind. And it appears that they do it through a 200 million man army or horsemen. Whether these are, is a physical army or a spiritual army, let's look at it. It says in verse 16, now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they do harm. So there's a 200 million man or horseman army. Now, that's an overwhelming number. By the way, just, you know, a little tidbit of history. When John wrote this in the first century, there was not even 200 million people on the entire planet. Did you know that? 200 million people on the entire global population. And yet now there's this word that there's going to be an army that's that big. Back in 1965 in Time Magazine, China shocked the world by declaring back in 1965 that they had a militia of 200 million soldiers, a militia, meaning that obviously they were trained in the military, but then back in their place of work and they could be called up like our reserves. And that shouldn't shock us because China is the biggest country in the world, 1.3 billion people. India is second with 1.1 billion. By 2050, India is going to surpass China in population because China is restricting its, its, its uh, population by every family only being able to have one child. But all Chinese families want their name to be perpetuated. So that happens through the mail. 
So they're all having only male children. They'll abort their daughters or, or whatever, not all, but it is a problem. And I guess that's one way to raise a 200 million man, and might I add, frustrated uh, 200 million young men with no girls in sight of marriage. <sighs> India is going to surpass them in population because India um, has no birth control laws whatsoever. So they're having children like crazy and they're gonna just fly right by China. That is to say though, is this a physical army when we describe the power that is in the mouth and the tail and fire, smoke, and brimstone, which are the three plagues that destroy a third of mankind. It could be fire power that, you know, uh, some kind of armament like in the military that shoots both out the front and out the back. It's possible. Some commentators think it is human in nature, but it doesn't need to be because God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire and brimstone and he didn't have any military to do it. So these could be supernatural, spiritual creatures that we see the description of, these horsemen that bring this kind of devastation. One way or another, the bottom line is a third of mankind is wiped out, which is, once again, one billion, 500 million people. Now, at this point, the population of the earth is reduced to half of its population. Can you see why Jesus said, unless these days were shortened, unless it's only a seven year period of time, less, uh, uh, unlike like a 14 year period of time, that there would be no flesh left on planet earth. But the thing that is really shocking to me in this little passage of scripture in verses 13 through 21 is the next section, verses 20 and 21. Follow along with me, it says, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent, it's repeated again, of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Five sins are mentioned that the people will not repent of, even though literally the world is coming apart at the seams around them. The old saying, there are no the atheists in foxholes, doesn't seem to apply in this tribulation period of time as men and women harden their hearts against the things of the Lord. They know it's him, they know it's his judgment, yet they will not repent of number one, their idolatry, that they worship demons. Paul told the Corinthians that when somebody worships an idol, though it might be a piece of wood, it's a piece of stone, it's a piece of metal, but when they worship it, that there is a spiritual demonic entity behind it. So Paul, those who would sacrifice to idols and then eat of the food, he said, I don't want you to be having communion with demons. Just as we worship the true and living God and we have communion with him and with one another, those who worship false things are worshiping and involved in the demonic activity according to this portion of scripture here in Revelation and they're communing with them. Now, our culture is not an idolatrous culture in the narrow sense of a statue and an idol. It's pretty foreign to us as a culture. But having been an Indian and been in Africa and a number of places like that, idolatry is rampant and a part of their culture. And though we might not worship, you know, a god of stone or metal or wood, I think something that maybe if the shoe fits, wear it a little better in our American culture, because we're not exempt from this kind of attitude, is that Colossians 3, 5, Paul the Apostle said that covetousness is like unto idolatry. That a greed for stuff and materialism and wealth, the God of mammon, Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. He gave the love of money a, a God title. Mammon is a false God. And I would say that's a little closer fit to us Americans. Mammon, the worship of money. Materialism, that we, we are covetous. We always need bigger, faster, newer, whatever. Now that is not to say that the prosperity of our country, and if you're a very prosperous person, that you're idolatrous. I know people that have a lot of stuff, but they love the Lord and they worship him. They serve the Lord. And then I know somebody that has hardly anything and they're just as covetous as the day is long. And so it's not really about what you have here today. No doubt in this kind of crowd, there are those who are very prosperous. You have nice homes, nice cars. You might have a summer home up in Island Park and all of those things. 
those, it's not wrong to have things. It's only wrong when the things have you. And you can tell the difference in your own heart. Because you see, all of us have to serve somebody. Everybody. You know, Bob Dylan said it so well. Everybody's got to serve somebody. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord. Well, Bob said it like this. You got to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. But you got to serve somebody. Now, there's something wrong with a generation that thinks that's music. No offense to you, Bob Dylan fans. But it's true, right? The greatest commandment in the scriptures, what is the greatest sin I should maybe put in front of that? Most people would go on to the next thing that we're going to see here, murder. But the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all that is within you. That is the greatest commandment. Not to do that, not to do that is the greatest sin. Do you understand that? Those who are here and maybe you kind of comfort yourself and you know I'm a good guy. I believe that there's a God. I'm a nice guy. I volunteer here and I do this or that. But to love the Lord your God is the greatest commandment. Therefore, to not do that is the greatest sin. And then everything else is covered by the second. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so this culture will not repent of their idolatry. When we were in Africa, I was really thinking about this week as I was studying because it's a culture that is still, um, well, just to give you a couple of instances about this, this list of, of five things, I think when the church is taken out of the world, just how graphically sin is going to exponentially grow. And in Africa, the witch doctor it has a lot of authority among the African people. And so there was a sister in the Lord at Calvary Chapel in Tebe, and uh, her husband was sick. So he went to the witch doctor. And the witch doctor told him that he needed to sac- make a big sacrifice so that he would be healed. Now, it wouldn't, wouldn't suffice to sacrifice a chicken or a goat or something like that, that he needed to sacrifice one of his kids if he really wanted to be healed. So the father goes home, gets his son, takes him to the place that he's going to sacrifice him, and the mom finds out. And you might say, well, how come he went to the house and she didn't know? In, in the African culture, it's so dysfunctional. A lot of times the guys might have three, four, five, six, seven kids, but he doesn't live at home. He, he's out there gallivanting around and, and hanging out with girls and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and here his wife's left to take care of things. And so this woman heard that he had taken her son, so by stealth, she went and found out where he had him and went and got him and then took the whole family to a safe place, lest he obey the witch doctor and go home and get one of his kids and sacrifice him. Now, one of the interns there, a young African man, said, you know, when we build a, when the, not the born-again Christians, but when the African people build a house, they'll want to protect it from the evil spirits. So if it's a small house, they'll sacrifice a chicken. They'll put it in the foundation or in the walls. And that, that sacrifice of that chicken is a protection from evil spirits. But if a businessman is going to build a big building for his business, you see a chicken doesn't suffice to keep the evil spirits away. So usually it requires a human sacrifice. And since there's all these kids wandering around, it's just, it's no big surprise when kids are missing all the time. They figure they probably just took them for some human sacrifice. You think, now does that happen in, that's happening today in Africa. It's mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, it's so foreign from our culture to think about such things. And yet, in this whole process, the Lord says they won't repent of their idolatry. They won't repent of, of sacrificing to idols. That these, these idols have eyes they can't see, they have ears they can't hear, they have feet they can't walk, they have a mouth but they can't speak. Idolatry is, is a crazy thing. But you know what? When people reject the true and living God, I've discovered they'll worship just about anything. And so, these people during this time won't repent of their idolatry. And then there's four sins that we might be maybe a little more familiar with since our uh, country leads the, the world in statistics on homicide. That they won't repent of their murder. That it's a violent time in history. They won't repent of their murder. They won't repent of their sorceries or sexual immorality or thefts. Murder and the violence of it. Just, you know, have, you, have you noticed just by observation how enamored our culture is on the normal um, networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, about murder shows? We start with CSI. Then we've got CSI Miami. We've got CSI New York. 
Because it's not enough to see, you know, one person killed or dismembered and then an autopsy and all the gruesome stuff. You got to have it going on in Miami and you got to have it going on. And then all of these spinoff shows that, oh, this is what sells. This is what sells is dead bodies, brutally, you know, dead. And then the autopsies. And that's what entertains us Americans in the evenings. Isn't that crazy? And, and not that you say, well, you know, I'm not out there murdering them. So I, I'm so thankful. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful, but, but do you see how um, comfortable we get with it? Do you see how comfortable we get with it? That it's just kind of a comfort there. In, in Africa, you are, are shocked once again by the, um, that life has no value. When we were there, this one fisherman slid another fisherman's throat and left him on the shore there on the property at Calvary Chapel the week before we came home. It was on a Monday. And so they called the cops. Now, if that happened here, you know, I mean, there's sirens and they're taping it off and it's a big investigation, right? Well, they call at eight o'clock in the morning or even earlier, they call the cops. The cops don't come till four o'clock that afternoon. The birds have come and begin to eat the body and everything else. And they just show up, oh, whatever, you know, no big deal. Just another dead one. Our missionary friends stopped to help a guy that had a wreck on his motorcycle and he died in their vehicle as they were trying to get him to the hospital. Died. They were taking their little boy who was having a birthday party. They had six kids in their rig going to a birthday party and this guy has a wreck right in front of him. They, they pick him up and they put him in the back of their rig to take his bleeding body to the hospital. They got to the hospital. The hospital said, why'd you bring him here? And we said, well, we thought you might save him. They said, well, he's dead. Get him out of here. I said, well, what do we do? Said, we'll take him to the police station. So they took him to the police station. And said, Here's this guy. We just, he wrecked right in front of us. He's, the doctor said he's dead. And, and, and they said, well, what would you bring him here for? <laughs> and the cops said, well, we, or they told the cops, well, we thought we would maybe get the family or something. They said, okay, we'll try to find his family. And they grabbed a hold of his body, the two officers, and they slung him out into the bushes. And they said, you know, the family will come in a week or so. They'll come get him. And the, here's these Americans just like totally shocked. But total disregard for human life. You know, when you take the Lord out of a person's heart or out of a culture, you have a godless world. And a lot of the population want a godless world. And this is what you get. Hard-hearted people that won't repent of idolatry. They won't worship the true and living God, but they'll worship everything false. Murder, sorceries. You say, well, you know, we're not really into sorceries. Well, this word in the Greek, just for you students of the word, is the word pharmakia, where is the, which is the word that we get pharmacy. It means drugs. So they won't repent of murder and they won't repent of their drugs. And so we, we see in our culture with... Uh, and there are times that people say, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about smoking pot, man. God's made every herb of the field. And I take them to places like this, and because it says it in a number of places, the sorcery, that the occult activity was linked intrinsically with, with the use of drugs. And yet we, we see mess being so rampant in our culture. We see whether it's, you know, all the drugs just rampant in our culture. But they won't repent. They won't repent of their drug use. They won't repent of their sexual immorality. They want to have sex with whoever, whenever, however they want to. And our culture is, it, I mean, everything is ripe in our world for this today. We're a sex-saturated culture. That's the magazines, the internet, the movies, the everywhere you turn it is, is the, a sensual, sex-crazed society. Now, sometimes when you come to church and you hear the word sex, even over the pulpit, there's like, oh, I can't believe you said that, Martha. <laughs> well, I think Christian people should know more about the whole realm of sex than anybody else and enjoy it more in the context in which God designed it. God designed sexual pleasure. You know that. You know that, right? He's the creator. He, he designed it to, to be fun and exciting and wonderful. God designed it to be that way. And it's a bummer when it's not for married folks, but God designed it. He said, hey, this is good. This is very good. Husbands, what? knock yourself out. Have fun. It's okay. God designed it. Be fruitful and multiply. But it's only perverted when it's taken outside of that context, right? 
So if God designed sexual relationships, there should be nothing embarrassing about talking about it. The Bible says that the marriage bed is pure and undefiled. There's nothing wrong with the husband and wife and the enjoyment and the freedom that they have in that. So the Lord just lays the boundaries to it and says, but if it's outside of marriage, if it's before marriage, if it's, if it's adultery while you're married, if it's, uh, if it's lesbian in nature, if it's homosexual in nature, and, and if it's bestiality, if it's animal in nature, and God goes through and he defines the whole thing. He says, you know, this is out of bounds, that's out of bounds, this is out of bounds, this is out of bounds, this is out of bounds, this, this is good, marriage is good. And you can enjoy the fullness of how God has designed the sexual relationship in the context of marriage. But in this time, in the future, people won't repent of their sexual immorality, even like today. You know, it's a huge issue in the church across America. People that are born again say Jesus is their Lord, but they don't believe the word of God and somehow they explain it all the way. They say, yeah, but pastor, I know we're shacked up together, but we love each other. Well, that's cool, then just get married and you'll be totally, I mean, you love each other, get married, God will bless it. It's cool, you get to enjoy that relationship. But as long as you're kind of in that shack, to, well, well, we're married in God's eyes, pastor, <laughs> really. The Lord says that we're to obey the laws of the land. So our land says, you know, you need to go through this little process. It doesn't have to be as a preacher. It could be the judge, whatever. But the Lord honors that. You know, as we look at this and this last thing and their thefts, they won't repent of their thefts and stealing. You know, before we're too hard on the future, people that won't repent, and it makes us scratch our head and go, man, there's all kinds of judgment and hardship and, and cataclysmic events going on, and they won't repent of their idolatry, of their murder, of their drug use, of their uh, sexual immorality, and last, of stealing and, and, and thieving. That's another thing in, in Africa is that all the, all the houses have bars on the, the doors and windows, and it's, it's kind of a crazy thing. And if you don't have bars on your doors and windows, you, you are saying you don't have anything or you're inviting people to come rob you according to their culture. And yet, we have thieves show up to church here. You know that? And I don't really mean the repentant kind. Just a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, our Christmas service, the weekend before Christmas, packed service, everybody's in here worshiping the Lord, remembering the birth of the Lord and, and all that stuff. And, and we have somebody out in the parking lot stealing. They, they smashed three different car windows and stole the purses of some of the people from our congregation on, on Sunday morning. You know, we're in here worshiping and they're out there stealing. Last year, we had somebody that had figured out how to get into our office area, our administrative offices, and during service, they would make their way, th- and, and all the staff, you know, trust that they're back there in their offices, they'd have their purses and things, and they'd go through and they would steal out of their purses that kept happening week after week. We could not catch them for the life of us. Couldn't figure it out. You know, as I look at this list, though it is about a future generation, or this generation yet in the future, maybe we could put it that way, that won't repent when they see the judgment of God coming. I look at us as Calvary Chapel and I say, you know what? Uh, This list sounds like a lot of people that I know here in our church that have repented and changed their heart and changed their life. Isn't that right? This is Calvary Chapel, so that means some of us have come out of a covetous lifestyle, some of us have come out of a sexual immoral lifestyle, some of us have come out of uh, a drug background, some of us have come out of a, you know, being thieves and stealing and things. Sounds a lot like my life before I knew Jesus. You know, I was charged with grand larceny when I was 15 years old. I was involved in drugs and sexual immorality and violence and if you were to say I was to serve somebody, I just served the God of partying. And you know, what's the distinguishing mark between a group of people or a room full of people like us here today who have, by and large, most of you, whether how much you're open about it or not, have a life that looks like this list. And then this future generation that's going through judgment and they have a life that looks like this list There's only one word between those two things, repentance. Those who will not repent and those who do. Now, repentance is just simply means to change your mind. It means to change your direction. 
It means, you know, I was worshiping idols. I'm not going to do that anymore. I was, I'm shacked up with my boyfriend or girlfriend, or I'm 17 and I'm sleeping with my boyfriend and, you know, having sex with him in the back of the car, you know, out on our dates or whatever. You, you're doing that and you just say, you know what? I'm going to turn from that. I'm not going to do that anymore. Because of my relationship with the Lord, that I want to honor him. I want to repent. I want to turn away. And the Lord says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed to cover all of our sins, all of our past sins, our present sins, our future sins. Jesus, all the wrath of God that should be coming your direction and my direction was all poured out on him so that I can step underneath the forgiveness that Jesus offers and be cleansed of my sins and be repentant, confess, change the direction. The only thing that lies between an unrepentant life and a repentant life is the realization of how much I need his forgiveness. How much I need his forgiveness. See, I'm painfully aware of my need for God's forgiveness in my own life. The Bible says those who are forgiven much love much. See, I know who I am. You know, if, if somebody had to say, hey, Rick, are, are you a sinner? Think, yeah, I'm, I, you don't have to convince me of that. Now, some people are here, to, you have to convince them. They think, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy, I'm a good gal. No, you're a sinner. No, really, I'm, I'm really a nice, you know what, let me just talk to your wife for a few minutes. <laughs> we'll settle this once and for all, we'll just take care of it. Because the ultimate basic path of sin is selfishness. Selfishness and doing what we want to do irregardless of how it affects other people is sin. Isaiah said it this way, we all have, like sheep have gone astray, each going on his own way, but the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And so, you know, on one hand, we're looking here at a prophetic event that's going to happen in the future. And I, I mean, it literally is mind blowing to me, man, these people won't repent. It could be them next. Fire, smoke, brimstone, heavy things, but they won't repent. They're committed to their drugs. They're committed to their stealing. They're committed to their sexual immorality. They're committed to their violence. They're committed to their idolatry. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. And you're gonna meet people like that in their life and they're gonna go through their whole life and they're gonna die in their sins and they're gonna be eternally separated from God. Though the Bible says that God desires that all should come to repentance and that none should perish. That's the heart of God. But he's given men and women a free will to live however they want to. You know, as we close our service today, is there a hardness in your heart? Is there a place that God is dealing with you and you've been stubborn and rebellious and you don't want to repent? Samuel, the wonderful prophet in the Old Testament, told Saul, the first king of Israel, Saul continually had a hard heart against God. And he told him, he said, your rebellion is like witchcraft. And... Your stubbornness is like iniquity. Now, we usually don't look at rebellion or stubbornness like witchcraft or sorcery. But the Lord says, you know what? When you're rebellious and you're stubborn towards me, that's what it's like. And I just believe that though we're looking at a message for a future event, that God has a word for us today. God has a word for us today. You know, the beautiful thing is there's nothing you've committed in this room. Not one of you that is unforgivable. Not one. You can be forgiven, you can be washed, you can be cleansed, your conscience can be cleansed, your mind can be cleansed. God can do a beautiful work in your life. He just asks you to turn, to repent, to ask for his cleansing. And he'll cleanse you. The only person that does not experience forgiveness is the person that will not ask. That's it. And so, we're not really that much different than the people in our story. We're not really that different from the generation that is yet to come that won't repent. The only difference is, will we turn our hearts and minds and want to be obedient to the Lord rather than continue to walk in our life of sin? Let's pray.